Well, but then without any further delay, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. They're best at that. Joe? Thanks for having me here. Um, this is a really exciting time for me. My uh, current positions are investment advisor at FSC Securities for 19 years. I'm current president of Grand Rapids Inventors Network and current president of Muskegon Inventors Network. And then my passion is as seen on TV and it's been going on for about 11 years now. So we had a store in the Lakes Mall here August 15th of 2001. And then we went to Woodland Mall, Rivertown Mall, and we've done numerous ex expos. Uh, but the exciting part about being here is if you have questions about inventors and entrepreneurs, it's an exciting time right now because of the change of technology, what's going on. We have so much research and resources that are free out there. Uh, wow, we can really advance things quite well. Thank you. Uh, Mike Suman, and I also would like to thank you for having me here. I live in Grand Rapids. I have um, been a part of the Muskegon Inventors Network, the Grand Rapids Inventor Network. I wrote a book titled uh, Should Your Idea Become a Business that's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. I re last year received my 51st patent. Um, I have four or five websites right now selling my own product. I license products. I just licensed a piece of furniture to a company in Ohio that's going to put it in um, Target and Staples and Walmart and Ikea starting in May. So I've been through that side. I've been a guest host on QVC with my own products. Um, and um, I have a every Tuesday, except for the first Tuesday of the month, radio show on NPR called Innovation Talk where I bring on guests, Joe's been a guest, where I bring on an attorney or a packaging person or a marketing person or something like that, and we talk just for a few minutes about, you know, things that entrepreneurial startup kind of things can do. So that's me. Eric Seifert, I'm local. I actually went to school here. I was very interested to hear about the MCC U of M connection because that's exactly what I did. Went to school here two years, went on to U of M business school. Grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My grandfather owned a dairy business, delivered milk, processed milk. Um, my father and uncle worked in that as well. I got the entrepreneurial bug early. I sold posters out of my high school locker. Uh, my mother had six children, um, had trouble finding babysitters, so she started a sitter's registry service that morphed into a home health care business. It was purchased by Upjohn. Um, in the mid-70s. Uh, most of my career I've spent in banking as a business lender, mostly doing small business loans. At the year 2006, I was the SBA lender of the year for the state of Michigan. Um, also been in and out of businesses. Uh, early in my banking career, I had a windsurfing shop here in town on the beach. It was a hobby business, a lot of fun, never made any money, but it was an uh, interesting lesson. and. Um, Recently, with my wife Kathy, we owned a home health care business. She's a nurse, and uh, we actually bought the business from Dave Stradell. So yep. things go around, come around. Uh, currently, I work with Grand Valley State University's Small Business Development Center. It's a nationwide program funded by the SBA and the uh, Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Our mission is to help businesses start, expand, survive, fine tune, and sometimes exit. I'm based in the GVSU. Michigan Alternative and Renewable Energy Center here on Lake on the lake. Um, the building's called Merrick, and I'm Eric from Merrick. In addition to helping um, businesses, I'm in a, on a team. There's 120 of us in the state of Michigan, SBDC. I'm on a team called the Growth Group, so I generally help establish businesses um, that are on a fast track to growth, um, mainly with financing objectives. I also work with uh, a group formed two years ago, the Muskegon Angels. Uh, that's a volunteer group of 24 local entrepreneurs who have pledged to provide $25,000 a year for five years, plus mentorship to help businesses start and expand in Muskegon County. And I'm the administrator for that group, so I deal with some startups as well as existing businesses there. Happy to be here. Let's start with the first question. All these gentlemen have been involved in entrepreneurship for more than a few years, so I'd like to ask them uh, to compare and contrast the op entrepreneur of 10 to 15 years ago to the entrepreneur of today. What similarities are you seeing? What differences are you seeing? Joe? 
Wow, that's uh, August 15th of 2001 is when we started asking on TV. And I have to say, uh, putting on my thinking cap and the capabilities what we had back then, we really didn't have the opportunity on the internet what we have nowadays. And so the, the slow process back then, and I would have to say that the retail experience, what I had back then was more time consuming. So if you wanna be a successful entrepreneur, time is very important and to be organized with that time and certainly at the beginning stage we had to go through all these different steps now when we actually open up a new store which we did in Rivertown this year we actually could open up a store within a within a day because of the capabilities of the advanced technology what were offered you know on somewhat of a free basis nowadays so I'm really really excited about that um, I have to say one thing what I would say is the most paramount part is be organized in your process of being an entrepreneur because if you get stuck in one particular area that holds you back and that makes you think much harder so if you can really consume the right time and block out for a stopping point and then get restarted again that certainly helps out. I would say the, the one word that comes to my mind is in the 10 to 15 year is speed. And that is speed in what the internet allows us to do and also the ability to prototype your product. Uh, 15 years ago, if you're gonna write some software and launch it, I mean, it was a two year process by the time you wrote the code and tested it and rewrote it. And now it's just grab, grab, grab. And if you have a, an app for a phone or a software product, if you, I mean, you're out there and selling it in six months or you're too late. And the same thing with a physical product. Now with the, uh, I went to the uh, Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas for a few days and they had two pavilions just for 3D printing. And it wasn't just the desktop stuff that we, that we all, all have seen. These were four foot cube 3D printers and they were making uh, several thousand parts at a time. And so now that you go right to CAD, you go right to the part, you can get right to the market and you, you may not have to put 400,000 or $200,000 in an injection mold tool. So you can, I think the one thing that, um, speed of the research, it hasn't been out there. Has it ever been out there and failed? Prototyping and getting it going for a market test for software or, or physical products. So I think speed is really increasing. Well, 15 years ago, the word entrepreneur wasn't very popular in the vocabulary at all. And um, some of us still have trouble pronouncing it, but Today we see a lot more models of entrepreneurs. You've got the movie, The Book, uh, you know, about Facebook. That's an entrepreneurial play. Um, Jobs, the movie, Steve Jobs, his story. Started in a garage, um, became uh, one of the most prolific uh, inventors of all times. Um, locally, uh, last year we celebrated uh, the birth of the snowboard here in Muskegon, Michigan, an Olympic sport that was born here in Muskegon by a true entrepreneur trying to find something for his two um, young daughters to play. So the whole concept of entrepreneurship is much more prevalent. Um, and it, it, it's something that uh, <clears throat> really needs to be played more in Muskegon. For years, you know, we relied on large industries to provide jobs for literally tens of thousands of people. Continental Motors, um, CWC, Foundry, they literally employed tens of thousands of people. And for several generations, the paper mill. You'd go to work there, your son or daughter might go to work there and expect to work there for life. Well, those shops are gone, but they're being replaced by young entrepreneurial places. Campbell White Cannon is a shadow of its former self, but now we've got local uh, instances such as Eagle Alloy, which started in a 20 by 40 um, pole barn building a couple miles from here. Now, uh, I think about the third largest privately owned employer in, in the city. Um, it's becoming easier to start a business. There's more support. Uh, the Chambers of Commerce, the uh, eMERGE organization that Dave and I belong to, um, all coordinate efforts to do, try to get training to people. We're trying to train people younger. Um, when I was with the Chamber of Commerce Entrepreneur um, 
advisory committee, we started working with uh, kids in high school. We started a competition for Entrepreneur of the Year, which is now quite popular. I think it's about the fourth or fifth year. Fifth year. We're pushing now down to the grade school level. The junior achievement people have a summer entrepreneurship camp uh, that addresses um, kids in middle school. So we're trying to give people model. Uh, it's relatively easy to start a business. To fail is okay, as long as you don't fail too often at the same thing. Sometimes the most uh, successful people have failed several times, but at different things. Um, and uh, the, the support's there. And with one of the, the newest um, uh, entrants into our uh, financing arena, crowd financing, crowd funding, it's gonna be a huge help to small businesses um, and to larger businesses as well. So I see some real exciting things on the horizon, uh, very different from 15 years ago. What role do you see formal education playing in developing future entrepreneurs? Eric, we'll start with you. <laughs> Our GVSU uh, representative. <laughs> of course. Uh, again, we're, we're starting to educate people as early as possible. Uh, we're working at the middle school level now. I think we're going to move down to the um, elementary school level before too long. Um, it's great to help kids get a start and get a taste for business. Um, we need to give them the models to show that there's an alternative to going working for someone else. You can start a business, you can employ people, or you can just be in business for yourself. That's just fine. Um, and in the upper uh, echelons, entrepreneurial training now is hotter than ever. For a long time, um, people were trained how to go to work for big businesses. When I went to University of Michigan, University of Michigan Business School, all the studying I did was in large businesses. I took Accounting, I majored in accounting. The accounting statements we um, worked on were audited financial statements, high-level statements by major corporations. When I came back to Muskegon to work for uh, what was Hackley Bank, now Comerica, in the commercial loan department, the financial statements I saw were for small businesses, micro-businesses, my mom and pop shops, some larger, shop, larger shops as well. But I had no training, and I didn't know what I was looking at. Today. There are specific tracks in the different um, colleges for small business and entrepreneurship. So I think it's a key element, um, the, the training, entrepreneurial training, uh, both in schools and outside of it. Our organization is very big on training. Uh, we offer a series of workshops here in Muskegon, actually throughout the state of Michigan in conjunction with the SCORE people. Um, there are specific um, training available both here at MCC and across the street at Baker as well. So it's a, it's a key tool. Mike? Um, education, I think, is going to, just my personal opinion, is about to take a change, and it needs to take a change, I think, to be more personalized for each one of us. Um, I sat on several uh, college advisory boards for curriculum in Michigan and we get together and talk about you know what does that check sheet look like what for this major or this major or this major and you look at on one side Steve Jobs Michael Dell and Bill Gates all dropped out of school um, they didn't get a degree but they got their basics there I was just talking to a young man the other day uh, in Grand Rapids that was a, a computer science major and I asked him what he was learning, what school he was going to. He, he said, well, I went to Calvin for a while and then I found out that I was teaching my professors. So I switched over to Grand Valley and I found out I was teaching my professors and now he got a job with the CIA somewhere in Virginia. And you know, so he didn't feel like he needed a degree. Some people feel like they do. So with all the online um, uh, degree kind of things that are popping up all over the, so it's, I think it's gonna be a combination of brick and mortar like here and um, internships, finding out what you like while you're going through that process, maybe some night school, and I just think it's going to be more um, personalized for what you like and what your strengths are um, than it ever has been. So that's the direction I see. You know, I have to agree with both of them, and to springboard off from that, um, I find the education is, is very, very important. 
to jump into the education process, the networking also helps because going and meeting all these different people during your, your classes, when you get out in the real world, you know, that process of networking is certainly important. In all of my careers, education has to be superior because there's so many new laws that are changing. But with what I have to offer is the passion. I have a passion on the investment side. I have a passion on the as seen on TV side. I have a passion on the inventor side. And I'm constantly going through a schooling process because there's new laws, there's new ways to do it out there. Like Mike said, it may be brick and mortar, it may be on the internet, it may be there. But my careers, I need constant new information to keep that passion going. And I believe the education process is, has to be there. Is there a difference between starting a business from scratch or from an invention versus perhaps buying into a franchise? Is that a good paraphrase? Okay, go ahead, Joe. And I bought into uh, As Seen on TV, which was a franchise. And the important part is they actually give you a template to follow. And that's the exciting part. Uh, you know, I can name some fast food restaurants. I could certainly name some sub shops. And when you do buy into a franchise, you're going to give up some equity in your business. You're also going to give up some money, but they're going to give you a template to follow. And we call that a menu of opportunity. And the exciting part about that is if you start veering off and sales start going down, the franchise E or the franchise or you're going to get together and they're going to say, well, follow the template or maybe we could tweak it for the demographics. And, and, and again, it all comes back to networking. If you're in a franchise, you can talk to other franchisees on how they're running their business and how it's either losing money or making money. So you have somebody you can go to and, and again, there's education and there's network involved in that. And I would certainly, in my view, would like a franchise versus going out on my own and trying to experiment and trying to tweak things most of the franchises have a system in place and certainly systems do work. I think it depends on the individual. I, I totally agree with Joe on the franchise part. Um, in my book I talk about are you an inventor, are you an innovator, are you an entrepreneur? And those are three different skill sets. And I've met very few people in my life that have all those skill sets. So you might be an inventor like myself that likes getting in my own lab and mixing things and catching things on fire and doing all that and go, wow, this is really cool. And you might have some of those skills, but there's totally different skill set to be an entrepreneur and run a business. Cash flow, insurance, taxes, hiring employees, firing employees. I mean, is that what you really want to do? So at Grin and Men, we try to find that out early in the process because you can be an inventor, but if you don't want to run your own business, which again is a different set of skills, you can do things like licensing. And uh, a lot of us have had some success doing that. So I think it kind of depends on what you really want to do on the, in that whole spectrum. Actually, a third dimension of that, too, we're, we're talking about here either starting a business from scratch with an invention or whatever, which has absolutely no track record and no customers to start with, very high risk, but um, it's, it's the lowest cost way to get into business. Franch franchise is the next step up, as has been mentioned, you're buying a proven process, um, you're buying uh, marketing assistance and whatnot and hopefully a well-known name well beyond that there's buying an existing business that is not a franchise and i deal with that quite a bit uh, especially today uh, there are a lot of businesses coming on the market more than ever because the um, leading edge of the baby boomers is of the age that they're looking to retire and uh, three four years ago they really couldn't sell because of the recession so there's a lot of pent-up demand so the least cost way to get in business is um, start from scratch, but you've got no cash flow to start with um, uh, and, and possibly no processes unless you've worked in that type of business, that industry, and you can bring something over. Franchise, excellent way to go, but there's a franchise fee up front. There's continuing uh, uh, kickbacks that you have to give to the franchisor. And then there's buying an existing business, which, um, uh, can be very good. You've got established customers, processes. A lot of times you get training from the seller, uh, sometimes financing partially from the seller. Um, 
but in that case, it's not all roses either. Sometimes there's skeletons in the closet that come out and <laughs> haunt you. So uh, I guess that's the other dimension I wanted to bring up. Okay, so if you're purchasing products for wholesale purposes, do you need to be licensed? How long does that process take? I think it depends on the industry. Um, I'm, I have a license for Major League Baseball, and that took about a year. And I have to guarantee them so much money every year. And uh, it was quite an educational process. But most, if you buy something with a brand name or something like that, then yeah, you have to go through a licensing process. But most products, like if you're going to sell something in retail, I'm not sure if you need a license or not. You know, again, it goes back to the, the networking on, through As Seen on TV because it's first to market with As Seen on TV. You want to get the product before everybody else does. Um, you know, I, I would say you really don't have to have a license, but you have to protect yourself. You know, are you going to do a LLC? You know, so you need to set up a startup business to get going with that. Um, but through, you know, there, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs out there just selling from dollar store to the internet on eBay on a regular basis. So you really, you know, in my opinion, you, you don't need a license, but you need to be very, very well prepared uh, under the startup business process. You probably need a sales tax license and you might need to register in the municipality that you're operating from, but beyond that, unless it's something that's licensed to sell, well, I sell marijuana. You get licensed for that today. It's a very profitable business. Out there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but other than that, it's, it's pretty simple. Well, let's get to the heart of the program. Is entrepreneurship truly on the rise, or in today's world of blast out media and overhype, are we just hearing more about it because the media has nothing else to talk about? I would say definitely it's on the rise. No question about it. <clears throat> the um, Internet allows you to develop a marketplace with, um, without the need for brick and mortar, meaning a place uh, to work from that people will come to you. Uh, I've had people that I've worked with that have a particular job and they find a, a niche to sell some product and they make good money at it. One nurse came to me. She had found a line of shoes that were very comfortable for people on the feet all the time. It wasn't available in any retail stores. She found a source for it because they didn't have a retail store in this area. They allowed her to buy it and sell it. Uh, she first started selling it to people in the hospital she worked with and then put it on uh, the internet, eBay, I believe, and she was making $25,000 a year doing that. Um, it was a pretty good piece of change. I think she was making 60 or 65 as a nurse, another 25 with that having a lot of fun with it so the um, facilities we have today through the internet um, I think is, is really helping with the expansion of businesses Mike uh, I think it's on the rise uh, that's sort of my life that's what I deal with um, you know with the radio show and I also write a weekly column for my biz on entrepreneurship um, go to all the grin and men meetings that I can uh -huh. I speak at a lot of different um, organizations. This weekend is the uh, International Houseware Show at McCormick Place in Chicago, and I'm, a, I'm speaking there on Saturday and meeting. I'll meet hundreds of people over the weekend, and, and for the most part, a lot of those people are startup. Not all of them, but some of them are, and that's, there's an inventor's corner there where I think um, I'll be judging, I think, 150 different brand new products that are coming to the market for the first time. And those people are all entrepreneurial startup kind of thing. So it's, I might have a, a jaded perspective, but to me, the whole world is doing it. So I think it's on the rise. Yeah, I, I strongly say it is on the rise. Uh, just with eBay, Amazon, and all the different categories out there where you can just get, you know, get started. Um, what I can see in retail malls now, rather than having you know, gigantic stores, we're seeing more smaller stores with, you know, people coming in with their ideas and, and selling it. Um, you're seeing photography in, in malls now. You're seeing numerous different unique stores what are out there. And most important, through the inventor group, what happens is we have inventors come in and they'll have an idea on a napkin and they'll say, look, I want to invent this. You know, and, and we have a process and a template called product review. 
So what they do is they come in and it's an elevator pitch. We give them five minutes to talk about their idea and then we give them 10 minutes worth of either, do you have another idea? Because that idea is not gonna work. <laughs> and where it comes in at though is they get excited because they have a passion for this product and they didn't really think at the end result, okay, once this product's made, how am I gonna sell it? And one of my claim to fames is, is how much does your product weigh? Because once your product gets weighed and it gets packaged, guess what? It has to get either shipped out to multiple stores or one store, or it'll be sold on the internet, which you would need retail packaging. But there, where it kicks in is you have to pay for shipping to send that product out. So a lot of times they don't come up with the actual cost for that product. And I think that's where it rises, where they actually have their product done and they go, how come my product's not selling? And so a template comes into place and then they go through a process. But uh, yeah, we can certainly see with the internet out there, entrepreneurship is kicking in. It's rising, where are these entrepreneurs coming from? Who are they? How can you, would you characterize them anyway? Well, I think it's a mix. I think it's a mix of people that um, are tired of their job and, and I wouldn't recommend that necessarily of jumping out and trying that and just quitting one day out of anger and starting. That's a long road and high risk. But um, I think that um, uh, with the onset of digital media, with the onset of, um, you know, people, I hire people to help me with my SEO, my search engine optimization stuff. And there's mom and pop stores like that and people who work right out of their house. I think with the communication and the internet, that it's really possible. I mean, people in here know better than I do that you can put up a website for a hundred bucks <coughs> in an afternoon and, you know, get a PayPal license and put it on eBay and be selling stuff within 24 hours for a very low cost. I mean, under a thousand bucks, you're up and running if you've got a product. And, um, you know, the SEO stuff takes everyday work. But yeah, I, I see it coming from everywhere, from people just starting out to people that are retiring and starting over on the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? Well, one of my favorite stories is a client I've got that had a successful landscaping business here in town and saw the need for a, a more productive leaf blower. So he built and <clears throat> developed the first ride-on commercial leaf blower available in the United States. I think there's one or two um, follow-ons now, but he's very successful. Um, guy's got no college education, had a success, successful business, identified a product, and went to, um, to design it. Um, so it's coming from all aspects. Uh, students, um, was it last year or the year before, the student winner of the youth entrepreneurship, she was a um, freshman. freshman in high school, Muskegon high, high School, female, African-American. She had a, a computer business that she was already making money in. And a, and a clothing business that mm -hmm. she was pitching. One thing I would want to just add to that is that at Grin and Men, and, I, and I'm sure Eric's organization does it too, as, as, as quick as it, and easy as it seems to be to, get, to start something up, there's a lot of people out there that take advantage of us, inventors, and you see them on TV a lot. Uh, some of the invent support things if step one is for you to send them five thousand dollars slow way down on that Because there's a lot of people out there just trying to rip you off So I would suggest you go to one of the organizations that we represent and we're all volunt I mean vo I volunteer he volunteers mm -hmm. a bunch of us do Because we got a list of people to stay away from so be very careful unless you know that person exactly what you're gonna get You have a contract out of it and some patent attorneys do that. They, they'll take your money whether they don't, they don't care whether your idea is good or bad. Other patent attorneys, the ones we work with, will say, if you're not going to make money on it, I'm not going to give you a patent if you don't know what you're doing. So just be a little bit careful, too. Men and Grin are great resources. I've been to uh, many of the meetings. Um, people are very willing to help. Um, people come to me and they're lost. They've got an idea. They don't want to tell you what the idea is because it's secret. Uh -huh. Eventually, get beyond that. But point is, I send them the men and grin. One group I want to get to is the Saginaw Investor Vendors Group, the Sin Group. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> There's Flint, Saginaw, Jackson, Detroit. They're they're really yeah. popping up all over. There's actually 11 inventor groups in the state of Michigan. And Muskegon was one of the initial models, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
How do businesses try and rich people off? What do they do? Well, like, like we said, the, you know, it can start all the way through the, I, in my mind, I have like 12 steps to start a business and there's somebody along that whole way. So you can start out with trying to get invent help and they want to rip you off and then some attorneys do. And then, you know, it's, a, it's not that it's a bad industry to start your own thing, but then all the way up to the marketing, you go to a marketing company and say, I need a brochure. I need some help on my website. Some of those marketing companies try to put you on a $10,000 a month retainer. And, and you don't want to do that. You know, you want to find a college kid that will give you some good artwork for four pizzas. You know, that kind of thing. So you just got to be careful through that whole process that if you don't know exactly what you're getting, don't just start writing checks. Right? You know, and I, I have to say it comes back to the education. It comes back to the networking. Because when you do network with others, you can ask, you know, hey, how was it successful for you? For you? And one of the successful stories I have is I <clears throat> have a friend of mine, he started with one product. He did the process to learn by mistakes. And so his, pro his product is selling well. So what he did, he's, he actually brought on another product from another inventor, and he's selling that. So his job or entrepreneurship is <clears throat> he has about 25 different products now what he sells. And through the connections, what he has, he can sell it to Walgreens. He can sell it to... 500 different fishing shops out there. He does sell outdoor uh, products. But that's how the networking you know, came out. And there's a template there where he's able to follow. And with that process, he's able to sell not just one product, 25 products to one store. So you'll find as that goes along. But it all comes down to networking and education in my opinion. Panel, what would you say are the hurdles that are facing modern entrepreneurs? Well, I think one of the, I, I think I'm top five, I won't go through them, but one of them is just you. It's, you, it's, it's all of us, it's individuals, starting out with our own idea. Do we, do we really get um, second opinions that it's not our moms, it's not our family, it's not our, you know, somebody that really is gonna give us some honest feedback because we have a tendency to fall in love with our own idea and not listening to um, to ourselves, um, you know that, that maybe we should. This isn't really going to go as well as, as it did. I've had many more failures than I've had successes. My QVC experience wasn't a good one. I was going to be on nine o'clock on a Saturday night, and then and then a Sunday, and I had a three-day contract. They moved me from nine o'clock to eleven fifty-six. Gave me four minutes, and I had to sell fifteen thousand dollars worth of product a minute, or I wasn't going to get the other two contracts. So I missed it, and. Um, you, when you go on to some place like QVC, you own all the inventory. If it doesn't sell, you have to pay to ship it, bring it all back uh -huh. to yourself. So I had 30,000 items that I had to, you know, I sold enough so I broke even on it, and then I sold them again to somebody else, so it ended up okay. But every step along that way, um, I think, is, is about you and your drive. When I got my Major League Baseball license, even though I, they gave me the names, phone numbers, emails, uh, cell phone numbers of every buyer in all 30 stadiums, it took me 29 phone calls to get the Yankees buyer to talk to me. So there was 100 of those targets. If they each took 30, that's 3,000 phone calls. So are you really willing to work a lot harder than you are at your job right now? Because it's exhausting. It's 24-7. It isn't. You don't turn it off at 5 o'clock. That isn't for everybody. So I'd say that's one of the lists. Talent. <laughs> Finding talented people to work for you and people that have the same motivation and whatnot. I work with a lot of successful businesses, uh, manufacturing and technology and whatnot. Their biggest challenge today is finding talented and motivated work workers. You know, we've still got an unemployment rate um, close to 9% here, but that doesn't mean that those people are necessarily good workers. So um, that, that's one of the major challenges. And I have to totally agree on the talent and then Mike with the, with the experience. Um, on my uh, fun experience over the years, I bought a lot of Snuggies through the As Seen on TV world. And lo and behold, I bought a large amount of Snuggies because they were selling well. Uh, one thing what I, I missed was the price of gasoline had gone from $2 a gallon to $3 a gallon to three twenty-five, And through that period of time, we were looking at a cost of $12.50, which was our wholesale cost. And then the transportation companies put a surcharge because the price of fuel was jumping so much. 
So with the surcharge, by the way, when I ordered them, I ordered 144 at a time of pros. When they ship them in a box, you get six in one box. So on each one of those boxes, I had to put additional $2.50 on per Snuggie. So where my mistake was is I kept ordering more and more, and I had an oversupply of Snuggies, and our final cost on Snuggies were right around $17, and we were trying to sell them at $19.99. And then our competitors came in, and they lowered the price down to $12.99. So one thing what you really have to look at is all the, you know, moving parts out there, being an entrepreneur and, and a buyer of different products. So having a talent in buying, and I've bought over 4,000 different Asking on TV items, and I certainly lost on some of those items. We made money and we kind of broke even, but, but talent and experience is, is really paramount. So how long did it take you? You just don't want to answer? <clears throat> that was actually a loss. We actually took a loss okay. on that product. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I do remember we did a promotion. We did a, a sham wow along with a Snuggie. <laughs> and we tried to, to wean out the, the process on that. So if you bought a, a Snuggie, you got a free sham wow too. So. But you have to put in perspective. You had in your uh, holiday store this year, how many end items did you have in there? I mean, you had. Uh, uh, you know, our, our goal was, uh, and to exceed that goal, we, we thought we'd just do about 150 different products. And uh, by the time we ended up, it was about 360 products. And where that came in is uh, customers would come in and said, do you carry this product? Do you carry this product? So what we were trying to do is start out with a few products, see what products sold, and then we would order a large quantity of those products. The fun experience, what I had, and uh, my wife, which is a very important role in it, is we kept getting people buying all different kind of products. So we were trying to make the customer happy. And at the end point, we ended up buying way too many products. So, but uh, yeah, it's fun. Mm -hmm. do, do we lack skilled workers or uh, they're just not willing to take a chance? Not, those skilled workers don't want to take a chance with that. Skilled workers don't want to work for a small startup company because it's risky? Okay. Well, even the well-established businesses have trouble finding skilled workers. It's a very tight market for tool and die makers, machinists, boundrymen. So it's not just the startups that have trouble finding people, but, but what you say is probably true that it's difficult for a startup to attract skilled workers because it's high risk. The most startups go out of business you know, within five years, so um, that's an interesting point you make. I'm, I do some work with Ferris also, and their top 10 uh, colleges inside the university have 100% placement. And I was talking to the person just last week that's running the plastics major there and they can't um, and they pay really well that's a very high earning job a plastics person that works with ejection molds and stuff and extrusions but they can't find kids that are interested to go in the curriculum uh, he says people just don't want to do that anymore and he said a lot of the plastic shops are just looking for these people but nobody is taking up that major anymore okay what are two or three stumbling blocks that our dear government puts in our way that maybe hinder us, and what can we do to get around? <laughs> well, the, the, the paperwork itself, just with taxes and, and, you know, Social Security on both sides, if you have employees and, and you know, capital gains and how you run the, the, your general ledger is, is just filled with rules by the, everything from, you know, SEC to, it just depends on the industry you're in. Um, for the most part, I personally think, this is just personal, that um, our legislators in uh, both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, uh, I just avoid them. I avoid all of them. I, I think if you get involved with that, you're going to have a, a problem. I think that they just fight with each other and the good things don't happen. So I, in fact, I wrote an article a few weeks ago on how that's really hindering, our whole political process is hindering, in my opinion, uh, the entrepreneurial process because um, they create rules that are just stumbling blocks that don't add any value, in, my, in some cases. Yeah, I'm neutral on that. Neutral? Okay. I'm neutral. Well, that's a toughie, but a good illustration is the Jobs Act from two years ago uh, established a place in the federal government for crowdfunding, and they've been struggling with putting the rules together 
for the last two years. You still can't do it on a national basis, but sometime in September or October of this year, um, a um, representative in the state legislature had the idea of putting together a bill um, for crowdfunding in the state of Michigan that passed in record time, in, in less than two months. You can do crowdfunding for uh, equity for stock in a company. In the state of Michigan now, if the company's located in Michigan and the investors are in Michigan, up to $2 million, and the feds still don't have their act together. They're still messing around with it. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is where you go out on social media to attract investors, customers, whatever. Kickstarter, um, Indiegogo. Indiegogo, there are a lot of national um, examples of it, but uh, how you might use it locally is if you have an idea for a business and if you can get enough local support for it, um, enough followers on Facebook or whatever, uh, you can then go out and publish that you want to attract investors. Um, they can send you any amount of money. You can establish a minimum, but they could send you $5, $500. Um, the law says they can invest up to $10,000. Um, and it's very inexpensive. It's very easy to do, ideally. Um, and it's illegal here in the state of Michigan. We're, we're the third state in the country, I think, to allow it. There, there's basically two kinds of crowdfunding. There's the backer kind, and that's if you go to Indiegogo or, the, or one of those sites and you and go to those sites and look at them because you'll see hundreds of them that people do it all around the world where I'm going to do this glass, I make a video about this glass, and that attracts backers, not investors. There's a big difference there, a backer. So if you give me $10, I'm going to give send you two of these when I'm successful, and if I get my crowdfunding, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to send you two of these glasses, and then I might say $50, I'm going to give you eight of these glasses. I've done that a lot. I've invested in four or five of those kinds of things. I just did another one last week by a company in Holland that's looking for some backing money. The other side of that is what Eric was talking about, um, also is, um, is sort of like a mini stock exchange, that you actually sell equity in your idea. And so you can go out and, like he said, I think a million or two million, depending on whether it's qualified or not, the investor, you can raise that kind of money, but now you're giving away equity, a piece of your company to each one of those folks. So you actually have to set up a stock value and go through that whole process. But Michigan is one of, the, I think, the third and only four states in the union doing that right now. So there's two parts to it. There's a company in Ann Arbor that developed a new virtual reality um, uh, headset for mostly for gamers, Avigat, they went on the national circuit. And if you're an accredited investor, which is a SEC defined term, meaning you've got more than $200,000 a year in annual income and a million dollars in assets, you can make these investments um, uh, under existing laws. But um, Avigat raised $750,000 um, crowdfunding a very popular product. In fact, I think they won a prize at the community, the CES. If your product has defects, what's the financial risk when the products are returned? Yeah, what is the hassle? And what's the hassle? Wow, I could tell you a really cool story with that scene on TV. <clears throat> Did you ever notice when you're watching an infomercial at 3 o'clock in the morning and you decide to order a product and it says four to six weeks delivery of a product? Right? Why is that? You know, you have UPS, you have FedEx, you know, you can have overnight. So why does it take so long? What As Seen on TV does is they actually do a video and a prototype of an actual product first without even making that product. So they'll run an infomercial in selected areas. They spend anywhere from $100,000 to $200,000 without even making that product. So if you and I call up on this product, and say I want to buy this product, they'll get a form of payment, correct? They'll either get a credit card or a check. What happens with that process is if, the, if they don't get enough people to call, they don't even make that product at all. That's why it's four to six weeks delivery of that product. So if it's unsuccessful, the only thing they're out is the videotaping and, and the airtime what they had to pay. But guess what, if the Snuggie or the ShamWow was successful or the Bacon Bowl 
which is exciting, or My Spy Birdhouse, which is really popular right now. They sold $50,000 worth of this product. What they do is they go to the bank and say, look, we have orders here for 50,000 pieces. Will you loan us the money and then we'll manufacture the product? So that's why there's a little lag time in there. What happens is they'll only make so many of those products and then they'll, they'll distribute them out in those areas where those people wanted them. And to make this a, a shorter version, if you buy a product on as seen on TV over the, over the telephone and you get the product and it's defective, you have to pay for the shipping and handling to send that back. And they found over the surveys what they've done, you'll do that two times and then possibly the third time. But after three times, if the product's defective, as seen on TV, no longer has a customer. That's what happens. Um, <clears throat> we did have defective products, what came into as seen on TV. We were actually a test model for them. And one quick example was a product called Kaboom, which is a cleaning agent. We've all seen Kaboom, what turns purple. Well, they would ship that product in a tall box with a nice bottle, the bottle would go inside, and it was very, very light. So when we bought them, I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. You pick them up, they're light, what's in it? Well, when we opened up the package, there was empty, but they gave you a little uh, packet of the ingredients. So then you actually had to add water into that product and mix it. Where did they save money with that product though? Shipping, right? People would pick up that product and they would not buy that product because they could not feel that liquid. And so that was a defective product on our end and we had a lot of products. So we got to send them back. And better yet, as seen on TV, called back and said, well, why don't you just pre-mix them for us and do that? So we were able to fix that defective product and sell it. So that was a successful story. Um, but yeah, it does cost when it, when, it, when it is defective. And I can tell you major companies out there, if they do get defective products more than twice, they're going to be real hesitant on ordering from you again. Um, but it does happen. You do use that as a accounting uh, loss, you know, against your business on that. But most of the time, if the products are successful and there's a process there where the life cycle of the product starts to die down, you will actually see that product at big lots. So they'll sell that product to big lots on a uh, discounted price. If you sell something on eBay, I have one product on eBay that has, I think, 3,700 positive comments and no negative. If you get a negative comment, it stays on your site for a year, and you'll do any, you, cut, you just really learn very quickly that customer service, you don't want returns. You don't want negative stuff because everybody reads it, and then other people don't buy. So one thing, if you do your own products, customer service is really, really, really important, and it can get expensive if you don't take care of it quickly. What's the correlation between customer service, training, and education? You know, um, having employees on, on the retail side, we, we have a, a manual to follow and, and, again, a template to follow. So, if, you know, if somebody brings in a, uh, a product that's defective, there's certainly a policy in place to go with that. Um, you know, it depends on every individual on the customer service the side. Or industry. You know, if you yeah. if if you've called a cable company, you know what bad customer service is. <laughs> if you try to find out what your bill is and why it's going up and things like that, and then there's other ind industries that do really really well. So um, I don't know. That's a very good question because I don't know of many curriculums and colleges I'm involved with that have a detailed customer service focus. Do you? I mean, 